if you want to get your messages um, believed, if you want to avoid a natural tendency amongst consumers to be skeptical, if you reach in a good mood, you're balancing the odds in your favor. Hi, I'm Neil Perkin, the host of Think with Google Firestarters. And Firestarters is a series of insightful conversations with the interested and interesting of the advertising, marketing, and innovation communities. And today, I'm lucky enough to be speaking to Richard Shotton. So Richard is an author, a consultant, speaker, specializing actually in the uh, applying findings from psychology and behavioral science to marketing. And he's also the author of a couple of great books on this. Uh, so The Choice Factory and uh, his new book, uh, The Illusion of Choice. Uh, so Richard, welcome to Firestarters. Uh, so I'm gonna dive straight into my first question, if I may, and just ask, what is your provocation for the Firestarters audience? Uh, my provocation would be, as an industry, we are not paying enough attention to psychology and behavioral science, that once this was the very heart of what we used to do, and I think we've let our eye off the ball, um, and then we're not giving it enough of the attention that it deserves. Okay, brilliant. So lots to dive into there. Just talk me through how we how we were, used yeah. to use it in the past and we're not now. What is it we're not doing? If you go back a long way back through advertising history, if you go back to kind of 1950s, early 60s, hugely successful and uh, influential psychologists were often deeply embedded in advertising agencies. There are people like uh, Louis Cheskin, world-renowned psychologist, worked with a number of brands that they could harness psychology. But then in the late 1950s, um, a guy called Vance Packard wrote a book called The Hidden Persuaders. And this book sold over a million copies. It's one of the most successful books in advertising ever written. And in that book, he makes a claim. It is just a claim. Um, he repeats the claim of a consultant called James Vickery who said that he had gone to a cinema, he'd worked this cinema, and they had flashed up images for Coca-Cola you know, at very, very fast speeds, one three thousandths of a second, and just by flashing up drink Coke without anyone ever realising it was too fast for the brain to process or to, to see at least, it led to huge increases in popcorn sales, Coke sales, like on the order of 50-60%. Now, when he reported this claim, at the time, it was a massive scandal. People were horrified that there was essentially mind control going on. And this era of reds under the bed, McCarthyism, fear of a, um, a red peril, the, the, this was a kind of shocking claim. So I think that partly led to psychology being tarnished with a you know, very, very negative um, set of associations it fell out of fashion people didn't want to use it and it took a long time i think just coming back to the the forefront again the the, the irony of all this though is later work later investigative journalism showed that james vicar had made up these claims then he people went to the cinema it didn't fit his description it didn't look anything like how he described it uh the people at the cinema had never heard of james vicary they denied any experiment ever run so it seems like uh, psychology was unfairly tarnished by a consultant that was basically just out to get a bit of celebrity and a bit of fame to, to sell his wares. So, yeah, there is a slight irony there uh, at the heart of it. So that, that's a, a great story. And I, I think one of the challenges really with this whole area is when we're looking at things like cognitive bias, for example, um, there's just so many cognitive bias. And you, you write really well and with some good practical tips about um, how to navigate the space. But um, uh, there's just so many of them. There's, I think 175 cognitive biases, I think, on the Wikipedia page, something like that. Uh, so as a marketer uh, or as an agency planner, how do you navigate all of that? Do you have a sort of framework or a fundamental way of actually uh, navigating that space. Yeah, so there's probably a couple. So the first thing people should do is is make sure that the studies and the biases and the insights that they draw on are from that smaller set of work, which has been shown to work repeatedly in lots of different circumstances. So something like priming. People might have heard of these fantastical stories about. Um, 
if I'm holding a hot cup of coffee, then I think someone is more friendly and warmer than if I'm holding a cold cup of coffee or a cold icy tea or whatever. You know, that kind of stuff. It was a one-off finding. No one can ever replicate the results. It's, it's just, it's hokum, basically. So you've got to, I think, draw a differentiation between studies like that, one-offs, and then meaningful studies like social proof, this idea that we uh, copy what others do, that if something appears popular, it will become more popular still. A study, an idea like that has been shown in hundreds upon hundreds of studies. So I think the first thing to do is, is have an attuned um, a tenor to to the genuine findings rather than just the, the make believe, and then maybe the second part is once you've done that, there are lots of frameworks that you can use that make it much easier to apply behavioural science. So just a framework, just a, a simple set of rules and processes for applying a topic. Um, there are a number of these things like Combi, Mindspace, Cialdini Six Principles. The one that I normally use, and the one that I recommend to other people in, in marketing, is one called the EAST framework. So it was set up by the Behavioural Insights team. This is a group of psychologists, behavioural scientists, that were employed by the government back in 2010 to try and make sure government communications drew on behavioural science. And they did a brilliant, brilliant job of distilling behavioural science into four big principles. So it's an acronym, EAST. That stands for make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, and make it timely. Those are the big four themes of behavioral science. Now, within each theme, there are lots of different experiments, but if people use a framework like that as an aid memoir to remind them of the big principles, I think that can be a very, very useful practical tool. And I'd just like to build on that because uh, there was an interesting uh, paper, research paper, which uh, which I read which was um, related to uh, navigating kind of behavioral science, uh, I guess, and biases in particular. Um, and it was talking about how biases have been studied in separate lines of research, largely, precluding the identification of uh, common principles across different cognitive biases. So basically, they were saying that many of them can be traced back to uh, a fundamental kind of prior belief. Uh, so humans' tendency towards belief consistent information processing, they say. So in other words, what they're saying here is that there are some fundamental underlying sort of principles that as humans we all have, like for example, uh, the belief that my experience is a reasonable reference or the fact that I'm a good person or that I make correct assessments of the world. And within that, you might have sort of um, you know, several biases which kind of relate to those fundamental principles. Is it possible to simplify it like that, to group these biases together? Yeah, I, I guess you can uh, move in and out in terms of your um, degree of perspective. I don't know if that's the right word, but you, you could take something like um, social proof, I think, and see that as a theme that explains many different uh, approaches. So social proof is this idea that um, we are a herd species, we are a social animal, uh, and one of the shortcuts for... Um, working out how to behave in an uncertain situation is to look to what others are doing now often people will use that bias and think okay well i should express my popularity i talk about nine out of ten people do this or a million people do that but you could see that exact same insight being an explanation for why scarcity works as well if we think something's in short supply and you haven't got long to take advantage of this promotion you can't take as much of this promotion home as you want uh, there's only so many spaces for this 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 product and you could argue that much of that um, much of the power of so much scarcity is driven by an interlinking the social proof it's it's the fact that other people have wanted this thing that makes it makes it in scarce supply so, so i think you're right there are um, areas that interlink absolutely um, the, the other the other big one that I think affects an awful lot of, of, of marketing is the idea that people try to um, deal with a complex life by simplifying it. So either they rely on quick rules of thumb, like pick the popular option, or, and this is a big theme again, they create habits. You know, rather than weigh up every single decision through a day, which would 
create an inordinate amount of effort. And as, as animals, we are trying to preserve our energy, so we don't want to waste precious cognitive resources. So you know, we try and avoid deeply thinking about matters. And instead, if we're faced with a similar situation, we just repeat the same behavior that we did last time in that situation. So I think that explains an awful lot of our behavior, this, this desire to simplify and avoid unnecessary energy expenditure. And then you can see all sorts of biases that relate to that. You know, there are many, many biases that look at, well, yes, habits are a long-term problem. If you want to change someone's behavior, that is. Well, here are some predictable moments when those habits are weakened and people are open to change. So as a, absolutely, habit breaking, there might be 10 different studies within that, that broad theme. So I think that's, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting, interesting approach to try and th theme behavioral biases. And I think um, one area which I'd like to ask about in particular is um, uh, around confirmation bias, which is something I've observed a lot in um, my work, which is and confirmation bias is, of course, the tendency that we have to look for the data, the research, the insight to confirm our existing worldview. Um, so uh, and that seems to kind of capture quite a lot within the sort of um, space of you know and analyzing data interpreting data measurement and so on do you think a bias like that is actually far more common than we think it is or am i just imagining it oh so, so, so that's that's interesting um the this well what there is a lot of evidence for is around overconfidence so i think there is certainly a lot of evidence that would support the idea that we underestimate that we are affected by confirmation bias. So some of the studies around overconfidence, um, there are studies around 90% of people say they're better drivers than average. Uh, a, a similarly large number will say they are better, they're, they're funnier than, than average or, or more intelligent than average. One of my favorite studies in this area, uh, and I think the, the cycle is called Sedekides, but we should definitely check that. But he ran a study amongst uh, people at a Young Offenders Institute. So they had been found guilty of crimes. And even this group thought that they were more ethical than the average person. So you can you can you can find some pretty amazing examples of quite how overconfident people are on a ridiculously wide range of settings. So in the same way we think we're a better driver or a more moral person than everyone else, I think it would probably be beyond doubt that we overestimate our ability to avoid biases like confirmation bias so i think that's a, that's a fair point yeah brilliant i love that story and um i'd like to ask a bit about measurement because we were talking there about the risk of um misinterpretation perhaps of data and so on and one of the uh, things i really liked i think you wrote about it in the choice factory was about um metrics and measures and the risk that we have of oversimplifying uh, and being overly reductive in our measurement of a complex challenge in fact actually there's a quote which uh, uh, i wrote down so that you say that uh, this process involves a trade-off a loss of representativeness in return for simplicity so problems arise when the trade-off is forgotten and tracking data is treated with reverence as it was as if it was the definitive answer rather than mere evidence so that oversimplification perhaps against complex issues uh, is, are these the kinds of um, biases which can really send us astray when it comes to measures, metrics? You know, tell, talk to me a bit about that. Yeah, there's um, there's a chapter in the first book uh, around what's called the cobra effect, but should probably be more accurately called the the the, the rat tail effect, because the the historical evidence for the cobra story is patchy. What there is very good evidence is is a story around. Um, there's a lot of historical evidence for a story from, from well, what is now Vietnam. And one of the colonial governors, through you know, presumably um, good intentions, wanted to reduce the prevalence of various diseases in, in, a, in a big city. Uh, and then what he does to do that is think, well, rats carry lots of diseases. Let's kill the rat population and we'll, we'll sort some of these problems out. So he rewarded rewards people for every um, hail that they hand into the governor's office, they get rewarded with a with a coin. 
And what he finds is that over time, there are a stupendous amount of rats to hells being dropped off and money being given out. But what they eventually realise, upon sighting lots of tailless rats running around the city, is that this poorly set metric has unleashed unleashed people's um, entrepreneurial powers. What people are doing is rather than kill rats, which have a value now, because each time they breathe, they produce a, a tail, which has a value. People are going out, finding rats, breeding rats, chopping off the tails of rats, releasing them and breeding more. So this poorly set metric created the the numbers that it initially wanted. Now, rats' tails were given in, but what they were actually trying to achieve, a reduction in the rat population, um, was, was missed out upon completely. So that, I think, is a nice analogy for many, many incentives, that if you set a target and there is a sliver of difference between the target and what you actually want to achieve, you end up creating these unintended consequences. So back in the, probably would have been early 20th century or late 19th century, that was assuming a rat's tail was the same as a, as a dead rat. Now it might be assuming a click is the same as a, a, a sale. Now, any difference in the metric of what you want leads to people optimizing the metric, not to the underlying desired behavior. And that causes all sorts of sorts of problems. Uh, so if I can just ask a bit about mm. how agencies can maybe apply behavioral science. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the beginning, in the provocation, you mentioned that there is an opportunity really to, to use behavioral science a lot more. Is there a risk here that uh, actually behavioral science get, gets used to serve agencies self interest or their own agenda, perhaps? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the behavioural science is just a description of what actually influences people. So it is a neutral tool. Um, you can use these tools for, for good or bad. Um, I think morally, behavioural science is, is, is neutral. But it's what ends that you put it to determines its morality. You know, in the same way, you've got lots of people writing about rhetoric. You know, how do you make communications powerful? How do you, you know, make uh, for great writing or, or, or speeches now you could then use those techniques to encourage people to love each other you could use those techniques to encourage people to hate each other it's not that rhetoric itself has morality it's what what end you put it to so i completely believe you can use this for good or you can use it for for bad there was one particularly interesting article you wrote, i think it was a, a marketing week column uh, where you were talking a bit about um, the moments that matter idea which is oh yeah yeah uh, you know big google thing obviously but um so you were talking a bit about how people don't act in the same way every day their behavior varies according to their mood and situation so brands are better off targeting those um and we obviously have a lot of media planners uh, who uh, view fire starters and, and listen to fire starters and so on so i'd just like to ask a bit more about your views on that so mm -hmm. Um, targeting my mood and situation can tell okay, sure, sure. specifically on the mood point and then maybe the broader point about situation on the mood point there's quite a few studies um, that suggest there are benefits of reaching people when they are feeling positive so either happy or relaxed the the initial study was a 2007 one by Fred Bronner so he was at the University of Amsterdam and in 2007 recruits 1287 people gets them to read through a newspaper and then at the end of that newspaper he asked them to recall any ads that they can and then he asked them to say what mood they're in you know were they happy were they sad were they relaxed were they stressed and he then cuts the recall data by uh, mood so if people were stressed i think it's that they remember 34 percent of ads if they were relaxed it was 50 percent higher so what would that be 52 percent of ads uh, and then i think the other one was if they were unhappy they remembered 35 percent ads if they were happy it's like 51 percent of ads something along those order it was a it was a 50 percent improvement from stressed to relaxed um unhappy to happy so 50 percent more likely in that positive state of mind to notice that now i read that study and thought it was fascinating but I thought, well, actually, advertisers aren't just interested in noticeability. Once someone's noticed an ad, you want them to act upon it. And some of that depends on whether they believe and like the ad. 
So I basically reran Bronner's study, but rather than questioning people as to recall, I questioned about believability of dads. And we found that people were 60% more likely, 60%-ish, more likely to believe the ads if they're in a good mood rather than a bad mood. And there is an evolutionary argument behind this. The argument goes that for most of our evolutionary history, if you were in a good mood, it signified an absence of danger, and therefore you didn't need to, to think critically. So if you want to get your messages um, believed, if you want to avoid a natural tendency amongst consumers to be skeptical, if you reach in a good mood, you're balancing the odds in your favor. So, so absolutely, what's so interesting about behavioral science is media planners definitely know that time is important and that, that the impact on that will vary. But what behavioral science does is it identify, um, I think, insights about what particular moment you should target that m- people may not realize. And it's not just that they make um, suggestions based on gut feeling, as so much marketing theory is. These are all based on peer reviewed observed studies. So that point about mood is a genuine finding, which if you act upon, you can have a reasonable degree of belief that it will that it will benefit you. There's also I remember um, a great story that you write about in uh, one of your books about uh, Sir Terry Leahy. And this was related actually to um, the need to sort of, uh, I guess, talk directly to, to customers, you know, just as alongside data. The need to actually just get that kind of uh, face-to-face sort of insight, and so Terry Lee, he was obviously the the uh, ex-chairman of uh, Tesco, but when he was uh, marketing officer, chief marketing officer, I think um, there was an example you write about of where he um, the gluten-free sales. They wanted to push the gluten-free range, yeah. and uh, I think the sales were not doing particularly well. And when they looked at the kind of basket sort of size and people were not actually spending a great deal um, on the gluten-free range. And so they could have just canned it and said, well, it's not working. But uh, so totally he actually interviewed customers that were buying from the range. And uh, they found out that uh, as a result of that, uh, those interviews, that customers were spending a lot more in stores that had a big, bigger range. And so rather than actually getting rid of the range, they actually doubled down and, and increased the range, which is just a fascinating example of how uh, interviews and, and speaking to directly to customers can um, uh, can inform you know, the data yeah. a lot more. So, so tell me a bit more about um, any thoughts you have around how you can combine data with that kind of human insight. Um, I, I really like that Terry Lee example. And I think it's exactly as you say, that if you had just looked at the direct sales of the gluten-free range it looked like a rounding error they're giving all this shelf space to something that was generating a very small amount of, of cash and this story to put it in perspective was you know 15 years ago so in the early days of when people might have been looking for this particular product but terry lee i think in, to his credit rather than accepting the the face value story of the data dug that little further and found out that if a mum or dad had a kid who was gluten-free, because not every supermarket had this range, they would, but every supermarket, of course, has tinned tomatoes and bottles of wine and cans of Coca-Cola. It was a significant differentiator between the supermarkets, and people didn't want to do two different trips. So the entire shop would switch to wherever had a half-decent gluten-free range. So there, I think, is a, is a really nice analogy that if you interpret data at, at face value, it tells you one story. And the point is to keep on probing that data, whether it's through interviews in the case of Terry Leahy, whether it's about setting up behavioral science experiments, but but taking time to understand if there is an alternative way of uh, I- I- explaining the information which might lead to a very different set of ideal actions and i think the core point in that terry Leahy story is yeah, give yourself the time and don't be seduced by whatever the, the kind of face story might be of a, of a particular bit of data we're running short on time unfortunately but um my last question is just really around um i guess post rationalization and whether you think there is a 
a risk or a danger of people actually just cherry picking or selecting yeah, yeah. biases as a kind of post rationalist exercise? They can be. I mean, I think there can be a positive angle on this, and people have to use their discretion. Because you're absolutely right, there is a danger that you come up with any old idea and then essentially do a Wikipedia search and find some bias to back it up, you know, very tenuously links. And I think if you go with that attitude, within a few presentations, the client is going to get suspicious and you're just you're going to tarnish your name and tarnish behavioural science name. So I think that would be a, you know, a, a problem. I mean, the other way of looking at it, right, the other end of the continuum is you'd be very purist and think, well, um, we're only going to generate ideas based on behavioural science insights, which seems a little bit too far the other way. I think there is a, a middle ground where sometimes there might be ideas that we know are right, but we struggle to persuade um, clients often to, to agree with. So one of those examples might be, let's say you're a copywriter and you might have a strong belief that it is important for your brand to write simply and clearly when you're in a meeting and you're trying to tell let's say a bank or a pharmaceutical brand that they should stop using these unnecessarily complex words and use simpler ones the client might well disagree and the client might well say well you know from my experience you need to use this jargon to be taken seriously and then the copywriter might think well what, what what evidence can I draw on? OK, well, the evidence that I know about as a copywriter for simple languages is, is George Orwell's dictums or, or another author's list of the right way to, to communicate. And the problem with using that as an evidence is it's evidence that persuades you as a copywriter, but not the client and the financial director who have very different uh, desires for information. So in that setting where you are trying to fight for something that would benefit your communication even if you were always going to recommend clear and simple plain language i think that's when that kind of post rationalization with behavioral science can be useful so for example in that specific example you could um, draw on a paper there's a lovely paper by a princeton psychologist called oppenheimer and his paper with probably the best ever academic title the paper is called consequences of erudite vernacular utilized irrespective of necessity and then there's a colon and it says all oh, the danger of using long words needlessly and in oppenheimer's study he gets bits of text and shows them to people and asks those people to rate the intelligence of the author the twist in the experiment is one group of people get the original text which is overflowing with jargon the second group of people get exactly the same content, but a few of the pompous jargon words are being replaced with simple alternatives. Then when those groups rate the intelligence of the author, you see a, a clear pattern, something of the order about 13 or 15 percent higher. The group who uh, read the simpler version, they rate the intelligence about, of the author at 13 to 15 percent higher. Now, why I'm running through that in detail is imagine this copywriter client argument situation. If you go with that peer reviewed paper, a prestigious psychologist at Princeton, you take people through the methodology. I think that's crucial. You show people the methodology, you show them re the results. Well, that to me is a much more powerful way of changing uh, a client's behavior than getting into a battle of authority and experience because. You know, you're just going to go round and round in circles. The client's got just as much experience and authority. So you could say that was post-rationalization. You could say the copywriter always wanted to recommend simple, plain English. But what behavioral science brings in that particular case maybe isn't a new idea, but it gives us the weight of evidence to persuade people who might not be um, uh, as excited as we are by, you know, advertising case study or advertising best practice. So so I think there can be an upside to that potential problem of post-rationalization. Richard, that has been absolutely fascinating. And um, for the viewers and uh, listeners, uh, I can recommend, I uh, highly recommend Richard's, both of Richard's books, uh, Choice Factory, and also his uh, new book, The Illusion of Choice. Uh, and uh, if you are listening and watching, don't forget to subscribe, of course, to Fire Starters and to share 
as well. But um, in the meantime, thank you very much uh, to my guests for today, uh, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you.